Hello, I'm Estelle Getty. I'd like to welcome you to Louise Hay's study course based on her best-selling book, You Can Heal Your Life. Louise has adapted her wonderful book in order for you to actively participate in the ideas and beliefs she so lovingly shares with all of us. I've used Louise tapes myself and have found that I am now willing to believe that things can be different in my life. I think you'll find that this tape gives you a wonderful opportunity to learn more about yourself and to begin to heal your life. Here, then, is your personal private counseling session with Louise Hay. Hello, I'm Louise Hay, and I'm here to share some ideas with you, to give you some new ideas to stimulate your thinking, to share some new perspectives. Let's know and affirm together that we are open and receptive to new ideas and to new ways of looking at life. I've often thought how beneficial it would be if these subjects could be taught in school from the very first grade. Think how helpful it would have been if, as a child, you were taught how to think and how to use your mind, and how to have self-esteem and self-worth, and how to have loving relationships, and how to be a good parent, and how to manage your finances. Just think how wonderful it would be to have a whole generation of adults who knew these things and manifested these truths. Were you taught any of this as a child? I think not. So let's share some of these ideas now, because it's never too late to learn. This is always the right moment. You see, I believe that life is really very simple. What we give out, we get back. And what we believe about ourselves becomes true for us. Our thinking creates our experiences. There is a law of thinking like everything else, like all of nature. There is a universal energy or law of mind or subconscious mind, whatever you want to call it. But to me it means the power that is within me and around me transforms my thoughts into experiences. You see, I believe that we are all responsible for everything in our lives. Every thought we think and every word we speak is creating our experiences, our future. And it's almost as though every time you think a thought or you speak a word, that universal intelligence or energy is listening or responding to what you are thinking or believing or saying, without judgment or criticism, totally accepting us at our own value. Whatever we choose to believe becomes true for us. You see, when we are little, we learn what to think about ourselves and what to believe about life from the adults around us. And when we grow up, we have a tendency to recreate in our emotional life the emotional environment we had as a child. Now, this is not good or bad or right or wrong. It just means that is what we believe to be true for us. And we also have a tendency to treat ourselves the way our parents treated us. We scold and punish ourselves in the same way. You can almost hear the words if you listen. And we love and praise ourselves in the same way if we were loved and praised as children. We also have a tendency to create relationships in our personal lives that were either the relationships we had with our mothers or with our fathers or that they had between them. Think about how many times you've had a relationship in your life that was like your parents, either your boss or your lover or your husband or wife. This is not in any way to blame our parents, because we're all victims of victims, and nobody can teach us anything that they don't know. If you were raised in a family where there was great anger, then you are most likely to be an angry person yourself, or you're frightened of anger. If you were raised in a fearful family, then no doubt you look at life through fearful eyes. Besides, you see, I believe that we choose our parents. I think we decide to incarnate upon this planet at particular points in time and space. And we come here because it's like a classroom. We have lessons to learn, 
You have your lessons and I have my lessons. And so before we come each time, I believe we choose our sex, we choose our color, we choose our country. And then we look around for the perfect set of parents that will mirror the lessons and patterns we came to work on. We choose these people as the perfect mirror for our work. Then most of us, when we grow up, have a tendency to point our fingers at our parents and say, you did it to me, it's all your fault. But really, if we're all responsible for everything in our lives, then there's no one to blame. All is in perfect, divine right order. And we are all doing our best according to the understanding, awareness, and knowledge that we have. Our point of power is always in the present moment. We create our future by our thoughts and actions of today. And we can know that no person, no place, and no thing has any power over us. We create all our situations and all our circumstances by our thinking, feeling patterns. And then we usually give away our power by blaming others when things do not go the way we want. Is this true for you? We all have things we believe and ideas about ourselves. Now, which one of these two ideas could be true for you? People are out to get me or everyone is always helpful? If you really believe that people are out to get you, then you're going to have those sorts of circumstances in your life. However, if you choose to change that belief to everyone is always helpful, then you will find that wherever you go in life, people are there to help you. Now, wouldn't it be better to think that way? We all have a lot of foolish ideas about life and what we believe about ourselves. And we have so many rigid rules about how life should be lived. But you see, we can't really do anything about the past. That's all done now. And everything you have experienced in your life up to this moment, you have created by your thoughts and your feelings and your beliefs of yesterday, last week, last month, last year, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, however far you go back. However, I repeat, the point of power is always in the present moment, which means that what you are choosing to begin to think right here and right now is going to create tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. The past has no power over us. The point of power is in this present moment. And we can begin to be free right here and right now. We do choose our own thoughts. We may not think so, but we do. It seems to me that almost everyone on this planet, myself included, and everyone I've ever worked with, is suffering from self-hatred and guilt to one degree or another. The more of it we have, the less our life works. And the less of it we have, the better our life works. It's like the bottom line for almost everyone that I know is, I'm not good enough. And we often add to that belief, and I don't do enough, and I don't deserve. Now, if we have a very strong belief in our subconscious mind, which to me is right here in the gut, that I'm not good enough and I don't deserve, then it's going to be extremely difficult for us to create a life that really works in all categories. Now, you see, no matter what the circumstances, we are only dealing with a thought. I don't believe in giving power to outer effects. We may think that being broke is the problem. I see this as the outer effect of an inner problem. It's the inner thought patterns which create these effects. I have discovered that patterns of resentment and criticism and fear and guilt cause more problems in our lives than anything else. Even on the physical level, resentment that is held for a long time and literally eats at the way at the body can become cancer. Criticism 
that's indulged for a long time can also lead to conditions like arthritis. And if you look at arthritic hands, you can almost see the criticism in them. Fear can contribute to anything from baldness to poor feet. And guilt always creates pain. Guilt seeks punishment, and punishment creates pain. So if someone comes to me that is in chronic pain, I know they're dealing with old guilt patterns. Love and joy and forgiveness are the big healers. They all come from the heart. The heart represents love, and the blood in the body is joy. So a normal, healthy heart lovingly pumps joy throughout the body, nourishing all the cells and organs, creating a loving, joyous atmosphere for the cells to do their work in. If a heart has lost its ability to express love and joy, the forgiveness will open the door. Most of our problems come from blaming others, from not taking responsibility for ourselves. And as I said, if it is true that we are all responsible for everything in our lives, then there's no one to blame, not even ourselves. And every outer experience is only a mirror of our inner thought patterns. Now this may be a new way of looking at life, because most people like to think that it's all their fault. It's the economy, or it's a husband, or a wife, or a boss, or it's because we don't have money, or it's whatever. But really, all those things out there are mirrors of what we think and believe inside. For instance, if everyone is always criticizing you, if you're a person that goes around saying, everybody's always criticizing me, then what I want you to realize is that it's your pattern to be criticized. Somewhere inside of you, and you may not be aware of this, there is a belief and it probably comes from your childhood, that you deserve to be criticized. And so because of your belief and because of your pattern, you pull people into your life who are critical. And sometimes you can even attract people who normally are not critical, but because they are with you and the vibrations that you're giving out, you will pull the criticism out of them. The other thing about this is, if people criticize you a lot, it's quite possible that you are very critical. And because what we give out comes back to us, then the criticism you're giving to other people, or perhaps to yourself, is being reflected by the people around you. So one of the first things that I like to do with people when there is a problem is to have them begin to say, I am willing to change the pattern in my consciousness that is creating this condition. I'm going to repeat that because it's very important. When you have a problem you wish to change, begin by saying to yourself, I am willing to change the pattern in my consciousness that is creating this condition. This simple sentence begins to get things moving. The universal power, the universal energy, the law of mind, your subconscious mind is constantly responding to every thought you think and every word you speak. So the moment we make the smallest shift in consciousness, our experience begins to change. It's your pattern, it's my pattern. We all have patterns we're working with. And as I said, most of the patterns we have come from the time we were three to five years old. These are our beliefs about life, our life scripts. However, we can change our attitudes towards the past and these life scripts. We are never stuck. You know, it's really very foolish to punish ourselves in the now because of some hurt in the past. To be hurt once is one thing, but then to continuously punish ourselves because of it is very sad and very unfulfilling. It's important that we dissolve resentment now because it can cause so many problems in the future. I've often said that to people. Do it before we're under the threat of the surgeon's knife. You see, then we have to deal with panic too. It's much easier to do it now. We have a choice of choosing to be a helpless victim 
and really believing it's all hopeless. And if we do, the universe will support us in that belief, and then all we do is go down the drain. Can you see how powerful we are? Our thoughts create our experiences. If I want to think that I'm unlovable, then I will be lonely for the rest of my life because I will prove my beliefs. However, if I want to change that belief into thinking that I am always surrounded by love and my life is full and rich, then that is what my life will become. My life will have to become a mirror of my inner experiences. So one of the things we want to do is to begin to release the pain of the past, to let it go, and to be willing to forgive. Do you know the Course in Miracles says, that all illness comes from a state of non-forgiveness and that whenever we are ill, we need to look around to see who it is we need to forgive. Now, this does not necessarily mean condoning poor behavior because I agree there are many people who behave poorly. Forgiving means to release our stuff on it and let ourselves be free and the other person be free. We understand that the people who mistreated us are also in pain, that they are doing the best they can, coming from the knowledge and awareness and understanding that they have at that particular point in time and space. I've learned over the years that there is only one thing to teach, and that is love. I teach people to love themselves in the here and now as they are. Self-approval and self-acceptance in the now are the keys to positive changes, and this means no self-criticism. In order to change our life on the outside, we must change inside, at least be willing to change ourselves. You don't have to know how to do this. Just be willing. We'll work on the house. Remember, and I'm going to say this often, every thought we think and every word we speak is being responded to by the universal energy. So the moment we say we're willing, it's amazing how the universe begins to help us. It brings us what we need. You see, there is a part of you that is ready to make an enormous change, and this is why you have created me in your life. With the use of this tape and the ideas I'm sharing with you, you have the opportunity to go over and over this tape, and each time you do, you're going to find a new idea to work with. And each time you do, you're going to look deeper into yourself, and quite the contrary to what you may have believed in the past, you are going to find incredibly beautiful treasures within you. First of all, we need to figure out what the problem is. Oh, I know. You think you know the problem. You don't care for the weight of your body, or you have an illness, or you can't get your money act together, or you're lonely, or you have a relationship that's not working, or you don't like your job, or you want to do something very different, or many things. But to me, these are all outer effects of an inner thought pattern that is creating them. And if we spend our time just looking at the outer effects and working with those, the moment we fix one, we'll create another one because the inner belief is still there and saying that we don't deserve on some level. Now, it's safe to look within and let's do it together. What I'd like you to do now is to pick up your pen and paper or notebook and on the top of the page, I want you to write, I should. And then I want you to finish that sentence in at least a half a dozen ways. Turn the tape off now and do that. And when you've finished, come back and we'll continue. Write, I should, on the top of the page, and then finish it at least six or seven times. All right. Now that you have your list made, what I would like you to do is to read off each one on the list by itself, saying, I should. And then my question to you is, why? This is not to make you wrong in any way, but just to have you look at something in a different way. So you may say, I should get up early in the morning. 
My question is, why? And then I want you to look inside yourself to find the answers. Do this with each should on your list. If you can do this exercise with a partner, even better. When you're finished with the list and made a note of your answers so that you remember them, then come back to me and we'll go further. I believe that should is one of the most awful words in the English language because every time we use the word should, we are in effect saying wrong. Either you were wrong or you are wrong or you're going to be wrong. And I don't think we need to be made wrong. I think we need to be right or at least come from a position of choice because all of life is choice and we want to be aware of that. So I would like to take the word should and put it in the wastebasket or throw it in the fire or in the trash or whatever you want to do. Remove it from your vocabulary forever and replace it with the word could because could gives us choice. Now it is true that sometimes it might be better for us to do something, but basically we still have choice and if we don't do it, at least we're not wrong. So what I want you to do now with this exercise is to reread your should list one at a time, only this time I want you to say, if I really wanted to, I could. If I really wanted to, I could get up early in the morning. And then my question to you is, so why don't you or why haven't you? And again, this is not to make you wrong, but to let you look at your shoulds and see how you really feel about them. So again, you can turn the tape off for a few moments and go through this process. If I really wanted to, I could. And so why haven't you? And when you've finished, come back. Now tell me, what did you learn? You know, most of us are so strict about our shoulds. There's such rigid rules in our lives. And most of them have to do with things that we either don't want to do or we don't like to do or are not us. And we find often when we go over this should list that we've been angry at ourselves for years because we don't do something that we don't want to do to begin with or it was never our idea or it was someone else's should. Perhaps the reason you've not done something on your should list is because you were afraid to do so. Now, instead of being bad, we find that you are only frightened. And this is a very different issue to work with. See, I like to take things off the should list. In fact, I like to remove them completely. What we can do is have them be choices. We could do them if we really wanted to. And if we're not doing them, then we probably don't want to do them. And we don't have to do them. So let's not try. Let's not berate ourselves. Let's not belittle ourselves for it anymore. This one little tiny exercise can show us so much about ourselves. So what can be dropped now from your should list? The next thing we want to do is to see where we are on the ladder of self-love. Now, I'm not talking about vanity and arrogance because that is not love. That's a form of fear. I am talking about respect, and acknowledgement for this beautiful being that we are. What we want to look at at this point is how we do not love ourselves. And we do this by scolding ourselves, by criticizing ourselves, by creating pain for ourselves, emotional and physical. We don't love ourselves by mistreating our bodies. Sometimes we misuse food or alcohol or drugs. Sometimes we don't love ourselves by believing that we are unlovable or by procrastinating or choosing people that mistreat us. And sometimes we don't love ourselves by creating debt and burden. And sometimes, well, we all have so many ways. What are your ways of not loving yourself? Think about that. Make a note of it. You could again turn off the set and make a list of the ways that you do not Love yourself.
Any denial of our good is not loving ourselves. And we can do that in so many different ways. You know, I once had a client who wore glasses and often wore contact lenses. And we weren't even working to improve her vision. But we were working to release some old pattern in her life that was really limiting her. And one day we had a big breakthrough. And the next day when she got up and she put on her contact lenses, they were bothering her. So she took them out and her vision was absolutely clear. She could see everything perfectly. And she spent the whole day saying, I don't believe it, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. And the next day, she was back to wearing her lenses. You see, the universe will back up whatever we say. And when good comes into our life and we deny it, this is an act of not loving ourselves, and we literally push it away. Sometimes we have a partner who's tired or grouchy, and we think that something's wrong with us. Or our marriage ends, and we believe it's all our fault, and that we're not good enough. Or we have one or two dates with somebody, and they never call again. And again, we think something is wrong with us. Sometimes we're afraid to ask for a raise, or our bodies may not match the latest fashions, and we think we're not good enough. Or we don't make the sale, or we don't get the part, and we think we're not good enough. Or we may have a fear of intimacy, and so we wind up having no sex or anonymous sex. How do you express your lack of self-esteem? Think about it. It's not that we're wrong or bad people. It's just that we're looking at what we'd like to change. And we all have things about us that could be changed if we want to make our lives work better. When we were little tiny babies, we knew the perfection of our being. We knew how wonderful we were. You look at any tiny baby and you see how wonderful they are. They're full of love and they're full of life and they ask for what they want and they express their feelings freely. When a little baby is angry, not only do you know it, the entire neighborhood knows it. And yet, two minutes later, their smile can light up a room because they express and it's over. And they always live in the now. And they reach out and ask for what they want. They're fabulous little babies. And they love their bodies from the top of their head all the way to the tip of their toes. They have no shame and no guilt. And they're not into comparison. And each one of us was like that. Then somewhere along the line we lost it. We listened to other frightened or angry people and believed what they told us. Where did you lose your love for yourself? All right. What I'd like you to do now is to pick up your hand mirror and I want you to look into your own eyes and say, I love and accept you exactly as you are. I want you to do this now. Go ahead. I love and accept you exactly as you are. Just notice your reactions. How do you react to doing this? How do you feel? What's coming up? Is it an easy exercise to do? Do you feel foolish? Does it seem hard to do? Does it make you feel angry? What sort of reactions are you having? I can remember when I used to criticize myself all the time when I looked in the mirror. I remember the endless hours I used to spend plucking my eyebrows to make myself barely acceptable. And I also remember I used to be frightened to look into my own eyes. Are you like that? Is this a difficult exercise? Because to me... This is one of our core issues, how we feel about ourselves. It's not important what's happening out there. It's not the size of our hips or our bank account or the fact that we have a lover or not, but how we feel about ourselves. Loving the self, to me, is the most important thing we can do. And this begins, as I said before, with no criticism. Do you criticize yourself? Oh, I've heard all the answers. Well, of course. I mean, how am I going to change if I don't? Well, if I don't do that, I won't be able to motivate myself. Doesn't everyone? Or I've always criticized myself. 
Well, we're not talking about everyone. We're talking about you. Everybody has their own answers and their own reasons. Why do you criticize yourself? What's wrong with you? In fact, at this point, I'd like you to stop and give yourself a little time to think and make a list of all the things that you think are wrong with you. And when you finish that, come back and we'll go on. Make a list of all the things you think are wrong with you. You will get the most out of this tape and the work we do if you allow yourself to take the time to do the exercises between the explanations. Now, let's talk about your list. Think about your list. Is it full of too short, too tall, too young, too old, too stupid, whatever? It always seems to be a lot of twos. And look at this list and notice, does it go with your should list? Are the items pretty much the same? See, it sounds to me like you're saying, I'm not good enough. And here we are again at the very bottom line, not loving ourselves. And this, to me, is the only real problem we have. Now, the next question is, where does this come from? Where do we get those ideas? How did we go from the perfection of a tiny baby who knew how wonderful it was to the feeling of being unlovable and unworthy and not good enough. You know, I like to think of us all as being like a rose. If you think of this flower, this gorgeous rose, from the time it is the tiniest little bud, as the petals begin to open, till it becomes a full blossom, till the last petal falls, a rose is always beautiful, always perfect, and ever-changing. And this is the way we are. We are always perfect wherever we are in life. And we want to see ourselves that way in the here and now. Yes, of course there are things we want to change. We all have things we want to alter in our lives. But it doesn't mean that we're bad people. We don't have to come from a space of being wrong. So in order to release ourselves from the belief we have about ourselves that are limiting, we want to examine the past. We want to see what these blocks are. If we don't see them, there's no way we can remove them. So we look and we see what they are, what are the beliefs, what are the concepts, what are the ideas that are limiting us, and then we remove them. To me, it's rather like mental house cleaning. All of us have to clean house periodically. Some of us do it more often than others. But there comes a time when you really must clean the house or it becomes impossible to live in. And I think it's the same thing with our mental houses. We need to periodically go through and do some house cleaning and toss out the old rubbish or the things that no longer suit us or no longer fit us. And we want to polish up those ideas that are positive and good and that nourish us and use them more often. You know, it really can be almost as easy as scraping bits of food off a plate into the trash after a meal. Now, you wouldn't go into yesterday's garbage to make tonight's meal. But how often do we go into yesterday's mental garbage to create tomorrow's experiences? The next exercise I'd like you to do is make a list of all the things your parents said were wrong with you all the negative messages you got. Again, turn the tape off and give yourself a bit of time to really let things come up, things that were said or implied about your body, things that were said about your abilities, things that were said about love and money and your creative talents and things like that. And of course, I know that your parents also said some wonderful things to you, but what we're really looking for are the negative messages that are probably still sitting in your subconscious mind. At this point, when I do this exercise in a workshop, it's interesting how the energy of the room usually begins to go down and people start to get very depressed. Now, you don't have to do that. You can look at this very objectively and just see what the messages are. Make your list of negative messages that came from your parents, verbal or implied, 
and do that now and then come back. All right, I want you to look at that list of negative messages, all the things that you heard as a child, because they're all sitting there in your subconscious mind, unless you've done something to release them and let them go. Try to be objective about it. And when you see something that creates a feeling within your body, let yourself say, oh, so that's where this belief came from, and realize that you're finding a treasure, because if you don't know where this came from, you'd just be operating on automatic for the rest of your life and wondering why things aren't working for you or wondering why you're always having the same experience. Well, I know why you repeat negative experiences. You're creating them because of some belief in here and that belief came to you when you were very little. Not only from your parents, but now if you'll dig a little deeper, you'll find that it came from other sources too. So again, I want you to continue this list of negative messages and look for the other negative messages you heard as a child, mostly before the age of 10. Things that you heard from your relatives, from teachers, from friends, from authority figures, from the church. Take some time to do this. And as you're doing it, notice your body. Notice how your body is reacting and feeling. Make your list now of negative messages from other sources. You see, these messages that you have written down are the very thoughts that make you feel not good enough. If we had a three-year-old child here in the middle of the room, and each one of us started to yell at the child and tell it how no good it was and how stupid it was and it shouldn't do this and it should do that and how dare it make a mistake and look at the mess it made. And maybe we hit that child a few times. What are we going to have? We're going to have a little child that cowers in the corner and behaves like a goody-goody. Or we're going to have a child that tears up the room. They will go one of two ways. But there is no way we're ever going to know the potential of this child. However, if we take that same little child and we tell it how wonderful it is and how much we love it and how beautiful it is and that we just love the way it does things and we think it's so creative and that it's okay for this child to make mistakes while it learns, then the potential that can come out of this child will blow your mind. Now, each one of us is always working with the three-year-old child within us. And most of us, unfortunately, spend our time yelling at the child. And then we wonder why our lives don't work. Maybe you were mistreated as a child. Maybe you were treated very badly, and that's sad. But if you're mistreating yourself in the here and now, then this is sadder still. So you have quite a list of negative messages now. Let's look at this list. Does this list go with your other list of what's wrong with you? And maybe even with your should list? I have a feeling it does. Our life scripts are based on our early messages. And until we can find those messages, we can't change our lives. But remember, all that is finished. It's over. It's in the past. And if we just go into blame, then we stay victim. And that's no fun. And you get to stay stuck in your problem. Blame keeps the problem. It keeps us stuck in the problem. And understanding lets us rise above it. The past cannot be changed. And the future is shaped by our current thinking. Our freedom in the here and now depends on our understanding our parents having understanding and compassion for them instead of just blame. We want to know that, like us, they were doing the best they could at that point in time and space with the understanding and awareness and knowledge that they had. Blame is not taking responsibility for ourselves and our own creative power. You see, they were just as frightened and scared as we are, and they could only teach us what they had been taught. 
What do you know about your parents' childhood before the age of ten? Think about it for a while. How much do you know? And if you don't know much and your parents are still alive, try to find out. Not in an accusing way, but just ask them, what was it like to be a little child? What was it like when you were five years old? And if your parents are gone and you can't find out from then, then let yourself imagine what it could be like. What kind of a childhood would your parents have had to have them be the sort of people they were when you were little? Understanding creates compassion. You see, you can't free yourself until you free them, and you can't forgive yourself until you forgive them. Now, perhaps you also have brothers or sisters. If they are older, they may have been like gods to you, and you may have taken very seriously the things that they said. Sometimes they may have considered you a nuisance, and you got the idea you weren't good enough. Teachers often say things that shape our lives. I remember when I was in the fifth grade, and the teacher called me up and said, What do you want to do in life? And I said, Oh, I want to be a dancer. And she said to me, Oh, let's leave that to the shorter girls. Tall girls can't dance. And I thought, Oh, dear. And I put away all my dancing aspirations in my pocket and literally didn't take them out till I was well over 40. School also creates so many interesting beliefs. For instance, if we think about tests and grades, were you really aware as a child that the tests you took and the grades you were getting had nothing to do with your self-worth? That they were showing you only how much you knew about a particular subject, and that's all. And most of us go through life reacting to the fear that we had as children when we had to take a test. We thought it had to do with whether we were good enough or not. When you were a child, your friends were just as mixed up as you were and had their own misinformation and may have taught you much nonsense or they may have said things that were very cruel. You had neighbors. What did the neighbors say? What did they think? Were you afraid of them? Were they friends? Then you think of the ads on TV and in the magazines. How did they shape how you feel about yourself? There are so many products that are sold on the basis of trying to teach you that you're not good enough or acceptable enough unless you use their product. Do you buy into that or do you see their game? See, our old messages of limitations come from many places and it always comes down to where did we get the messages that we're not good enough? And then, of course, the next thing is how to transcend our limitations no matter what they told us. See, it doesn't matter what other people say about us. It's how we react to it and what we're choosing to believe about ourselves. You know, Gerald Jampolsky has written a couple of wonderful books. In Teach Only Love, he said something I thought was brilliant. He said, if you want to increase your spiritual growth as quickly as possible, or if you want to get out of a problem as quickly as possible, Choose to think only happy thoughts. You see, you can only think one thing at a time. You can spend your time thinking about joyous experiences. You can love yourself. Or you can spend your time doing what I call griping and grunging, thinking about the past and all the failures and all the things that went wrong and how you're not good enough and how things may go wrong in the future is a sure way to continue to have failures. But that's not the way to create a wonderful life. Loving yourself and thinking joyful, happy thoughts is the quickest route you can take. So the next question is, now that we've looked at all these things, now that we have this list of all the things that are wrong with us and the list of all the things our parents said were wrong with us and the neighbors and the friends and the church and the authority figures, the next question is, is it true? Look at your list. What do you still believe is true for you? Is it really true? And the answer to me is both yes and no. All these negative things are true if you believe them about yourself. And they're not true if you don't believe them. 
and you can tell what you believe just by looking at your experiences. If you have a lack of finances or you really can't get your money act together, then there must be a belief within you of burdens and debts. If you're a lonely person, then there must be a belief in there that says, nobody loves me or I'm unlovable. If you're ill a lot, then you must have crippling thoughts of some sort. You may not consciously be aware of these thoughts, but if you look to your circumstances, you can begin to see what kind of thoughts you must have. So think of all the things in your life that are not working, because that's what we're concentrating on now. This is what we want to change. And ask yourself, what kind of thoughts could be creating these conditions? Could they be some of the things on your list? Some of the beliefs that we have are very positive and nourishing, and we want to keep those beliefs. We want to use them often because they work for us. And some of the things we believe are no longer appropriate. And some of the things we believe were never true. They were someone else's fears. All those things on your list were other people's opinions. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is it true? And you'll get the answer by looking around you at your circumstances. You see, our circumstances always show us what we believe. I remember once when I was a little girl in school. And this memory is so vivid for me because it's so typical of my beliefs about myself at the time. I remember that we had a party in school and it was a gala affair. And everybody brought a lot of party stuff and things like that. And there was lots of cake and there was so much cake that when the teacher was cutting it, several children got several pieces of cake. And yet, when it was my turn and I came up for a piece of cake, and of course with my belief system, I was last. There was no cake left. And all the children who had cake all the time and who believed that it was their right to have cake were having lots of cake. And I, who never had cake and believed that I was not good enough and did not deserve any. There wasn't one piece left for me. It's a perfect example of how we create our circumstances by our beliefs. You see, if you grew up in a family where you were told all the time that it's all your fault, then you're going to go around feeling guilty most of your life and probably saying, I'm sorry, all the time. Or you will manipulate others through guilt. If you have a belief that nobody loved you, then you're either going to have no romances or you'll probably have very short romances. If we go around saying, well, that's the way I am or that's the way life is, that's expressing a belief and perhaps it came from other people's opinions. It's not true for us or it is true for us depending on how we accept it. Stop accepting their limitations. We always have another way of looking at life. You know, many people get up in the morning, and if it's raining, they look out the window and say, Oh, what a lousy day. Well, it isn't a lousy day. It's a wet day. But if we choose to believe it's a lousy day, then that's what we'll have, because we will create it. If we choose to believe it's a wet day, then we'll put on the appropriate clothing and do what we do on rainy days. There is no good or bad, there is no right or wrong, except that we make it so. And you know, every culture on this planet has different rules about those things. It's what we believe that makes things right or wrong or good or bad. And again, it's the old thing, what we give out, we get back, and usually in double. We want to begin to shift our beliefs today, to be willing to allow the changes to happen. The point of power is always in the present moment. And all these old things, these lacks, these limitations, these beliefs, can return to the nothingness from whence they came. They came out of nothing and they can go back to it. You are the power. No person, no place, no thing has any power over you. I can give you lots of good advice and lots of wonderful new ideas, 
But if you choose not to accept them, then you're in control, for you have the power. You are the only person that thinks in your mind, and you create your experiences. And just for this moment, I want you to catch the thought you're thinking right now and ask yourself, is it negative, or is it positive, or is it neutral? Do you want this thought to create your future? Now, because we think so quickly, and the thoughts just go whizzing through our minds, it's not always so easy to begin changing our thoughts. You can start by editing your speech. Begin to listen to what you say. And don't say anything that you don't want to become true for you. There are literally billions of thoughts that you can think and infinite numbers of things that you can say. Make these be nourishing thoughts. Pick thoughts that create nourishing experiences for you. Don't waste time thinking thoughts that create problems for you and then try to fix the problem. That, to me, is foolish and a waste of time. One of my very early teachers used to say often, there is not something to do, there is something to know. Because truly, when we change our thinking, we change our experiences. All right, so what do we do now? Well, I think we can decide to change. That, to me, is the most important thing now. Oh, we can throw up our hands in horror and give up or get angry or feel that it's all helpless and hopeless. But these are old and useless ways of handling things. If we think, oh, it's hopeless, so why try, because at least I can handle the pain, and I know what that is. Well, that's just getting stuck and staying in the same old place. And you certainly have the choice of doing that, but you don't have to. And getting angry about circumstances. Well, to me, that's like sitting in a corner with a dunce hat on. You know, something happens and we get angry, and something else happens and we get angry, and we don't do anything about it. Do you know that people who commit suicide do so because they won't change their minds? They believe that life is only one way, and they don't want to look in another way or see another viewpoint. They refuse to believe there are other possibilities, and so they leave the planet instead. Getting angry or upset continuously because things aren't working, again, is sort of foolish and a wasted energy. What is really better is for you to ask yourself, how am I creating so many situations to be angry or upset at? And then sit down and really give yourself a chance to think about that. What could I be doing or believing that is creating this? And again, this is not to make you wrong but just to let you look at what could be happening. When we start this work, I like to think of it very much like the end of a Thanksgiving dinner. You know, you've had all this wonderful Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's eaten much too much. And then it's time to go into the kitchen and clean up the turkey pan. And there it sits, all crusty and burnt, and it looks a mess. So the first thing you do is to put in some hot water and soap and you let it soak. And then after it's soaked for a while, you start to scrape it, and all these bits come up. And then it really looks a mess. And if you didn't know better, you'd think that the pan would always be disgusting. However, if you keep going, after a little while, you're going to have a nice, clean turkey pan. Our consciousness is very much like that. When we begin to do this work, we go in and we start to clean our mental turkey pan. And sometimes things get worse before they get better. We want to know that it's okay if that happens and to just flow with it. I think mirror work is very important. And the more we can do it, the more we can reflect to ourselves where we are and what we need to do. So keep looking in the mirror and saying to yourself, I am willing to change, and I am willing to release the resistance. I am willing to change, and I am willing to release the resistance. Now all of us have to deal with what I call resistance to change, and we all have resistance, because on some level 
We want everything and everyone out there to change, but we don't want to have to change ourselves. And yet, changing ourselves is the very thing we must do in order to change our lives. So awareness is our next step. We must become aware of what it is that we believe. Otherwise, we don't know what to change. Our first reaction to a new awareness about ourselves is often resistance. And that's all right, because any reaction is good. It means the change is already in process. Let yourself notice how you react so that you are aware of what's going on. Our lessons are not necessarily easy. If they were easy, they wouldn't be lessons. It takes time and effort to learn what we need to learn. So don't demand instant change. Let yourself do it step by step. It will get easier as you go along. Too often we get impatient and we want to do things right now. Impatience is only resistance to learning. It means you want the goal without going through the process. You know, we can sit here and say, I want to be in the other room. And we can even demand and insist that we are in the other room right now. But we don't want to make the effort of getting up and going one step at a time in order to get to the other room. And we can sit here for days and keep yelling and insisting we want to be in the next room. And nothing will happen except that we get frustrated. However, if we make the effort and take the steps, no matter how small, one by one, before you know it, we will be there. Keep noticing what is going on in your body and what form your resistance may be taking. It's fascinating to watch how the mind works and learns. And the thing we resist the most is often that which we most need to learn. If you keep saying, I can't or I won't, you're probably referring to a lesson that is important to you. Think for a moment. What do you think you came to this planet for? What is your lesson? What did you come to learn? And what did you come to teach? I do not believe you came here to be miserable or to be unfulfilled. I believe you came here to be fulfilled and to give of yourself to others. We are all teachers and students. We are learning and we are teaching. You could ask yourself that question before you go to sleep tonight. What did I come here to learn? And what did I come here to teach? Let's look now into how we resist, because all of us resist change in some ways. We have so many ways to do this. There are many nonverbal ways. All sorts of things like we could leave the room, begin to do something else, start flipping through a magazine or pretending we don't hear. We also use assumptions such as it won't do any good or they won't let me or they won't understand. Or we may have beliefs that are part of our resistance, like it's not done or I can't do that or it's too much work. And then, of course, there's always them. We use them as our excuse for resistance. We give our power to them, and we say things like, my husband or wife won't let me, or the stars or the cards are against it, or my doctor says no, or they have to change before I can, or it's against my religion or my beliefs, or we put our changes on hold by saying, I'll do it later, or the time isn't right, or after I move. We might use fear as our resistance. I might get hurt, or what will the neighbors think? Or I would rather die first, or I'd rather be divorced first, or I'm afraid to tell my husband or wife or boss. Don't all of these excuses add up to saying, I'm really not good enough? Many of you may be taking notes to give to your friends. You know exactly how to change them. Leave your friends alone. When we first begin to get some insights on how our minds work and how we can change, we want to run around giving our friends advice on what they can do to change their lives. We say, do you know what's wrong with you? And this never works. They will not listen to you unless you change your life first. 
The only way we can teach is by example. When we have made our own changes, then our friends and our families will come to us and say, you're so different, what have you done? And then they'll be glad to listen and maybe even try what you have done. When I first began teaching, I was not really practicing these principles and my students didn't make too many changes in their lives. And it wasn't until I began to practice and to live that which I was teaching that I really began to help other people. So hold down your enthusiasm and don't run around trying to heal all your friends. Do your own mental work and heal yourself. This will do more good for those around you than anything else. Besides, we can't learn other people's lessons for them. They must do the work themselves, and they won't do it until they are ready. The student must come to the teacher, or it won't work. Now and then, someone will ask me to go and call or see their friend who needs help, and it doesn't work that way. The person must ask for help themselves, or they're not ready to change. Once in a while, someone would get a lesson with Louise as a present, and I stopped accepting those people as clients, for it was a waste of time. Either they would not show up, or be late, or get nothing out of the session. When the student is ready, the teacher always appears. We all want our families to accept us just as we are. Well, remember, what we give out, we get back. So if you want love and acceptance from your family, then this is what you must give to your family. When you are willing to accept them exactly as they are, then they will begin to accept you exactly as you are. We must be willing to practice what we want to have. The golden rule is ancient. It was never created to make us into goody-goody people. It was showing us a principle of truth. Give unto others as you would have them give unto you. Let's use the mirror to check our resistance level. Look into your eyes and say, I am willing to change. I am willing to change. Are you hesitating? Do you feel that it's not true? What is the belief that's in the way? Remember, it's only a thought, and a thought can be changed. Don't let this thought stop you from becoming free. We are looking for the real problem, not just the outer effect or issue. We create habits and problems to fulfill a need within us. When we can find a positive way to fulfill that need, we can release the problem. Willpower and discipline don't work to make permanent changes. See, if you're overweight and you diet, you can have all the willpower and discipline in the world. You can be really strong, and for months you may not eat one mouthful of food that you shouldn't eat. And the moment you drop your willpower and discipline, bloop, there's the weight again. It's because you haven't dealt with the real issue. You've only worked on the outer effect. The real issue with weight is usually fear, which creates fat for protection. And you can fight fat all your life and never get to the real issue. And you would probably die believing you were not good enough because you couldn't lose weight. Your need to feel safe could be fulfilled in a more positive way. Then the weight would leave by itself. So let's look a little deeper. If you're having problems with the last affirmation, I'm willing to change, then do this one. I'm willing to release the need for this problem or resistance. Let go of the need you have. Now, procrastination is another form of resistance, of saying you're not good enough. If you procrastinate, then you will not allow yourself to have what it is you say you want. Resenting another person having good in their life is another form of resistance to your own good. You will be giving out resistance to good, and that is what you will create in your own life. There is plenty for everyone. No matter how much air you breathe, there's still an abundance for every person on the planet to have as much as they can use. Many of us were raised to be victims, to feel that they are doing it to us. 
The problem with being a victim is a victim is stuck in their problem. And we no longer choose to be stuck. We are learning there is something we can do to free ourselves. If we say, I am willing to release the pattern in my consciousness that is creating this condition, then immediately we step out of the victim class and we begin to take our own power back. We realize that we can dissolve the problem that we helped create. See, when we scold ourselves, when we berate ourselves or make ourselves wrong, we are mistreating that three-year-old child within us. How can we be happy and free when the child within us is miserable and frightened? If you had a frightened child before you, you would probably comfort the child so that it could feel safe and happy. Be gentle and kind and comforting with your inner child as you uncover and release the old negative messages within you. This is a wonderful adventure you're on, and you will never go through this particular process again. See today as a very exciting time of your life. Once you work through these issues, they will be gone and your life will be different. As you choose to work with your other issues, it will be much easier. We've uncovered some patterns, and now your next question may be, how do I change? Well, you've already begun. There are changes taking place within you that you're not even aware of. And from now on, all your changes are for the better, even if it does not seem to be so. Sometimes, things seem to be worse at first. Remember our turkey pan. You may need to scrape up some gook from the bottom of your pan as you do your own mental cleansing process. You may be working on getting a new job, and you may be fired. See this as the first step in moving you to your new position. You may be working on prosperity, and you lose your wallet. Don't panic and give up. This could be part of the positive change that's taking place. You may be working on relationships, and you have a fight or you're working on health and you develop a cold. These are all temporary experiences that are part of releasing the junk of the past. Try to understand that the movement that is taking place in your life is what I call divine right action, and that it's working for your highest good. Things will definitely be shifting inside of you. So include an affirmation that says... All my changes are comfortable and easy and fun. All is well in my life is an affirmation I used over and over again as I work through my own cleansing process. What is it you want to change in your life? What sort of problem or issue do you have that you want to release? Think about this for a moment. You could discuss this with a partner, or you could use your mirror as a partner. Either way, say this with me. I realize that I have created this problem, and now I am willing to release the pattern in my consciousness that is keeping this condition. Let's say it once more. I realize that I have created this problem, and I am now willing to release the pattern in my consciousness that is creating this condition. How does it feel? Are you really ready to step out of the bondage of the past? Or is there still resistance and hesitation? Don't wait until you figure out how to do this. Just have the willingness to let go. All you need to do is change your thoughts, and that universal intelligence, your subconscious mind, will figure out the hows. Your willingness to release will start the ball rolling and things will begin to shift. Whatever the shift is, see it as positive. Your thoughts do not control you. You control your thoughts. You are much more than your mind. Your mind is a tool you use, and the way you've been using it is a habit, and you can change the habit. It may feel strange at first, but with practice, it will become easier. Just for a moment, I want you to clasp your hands together. 
Now, there's no right or wrong way to do this. Just notice which thumb is on top. Now, unclasp your hands and clasp them together with the other thumb on top. And notice how that feels. It might feel different. It might feel strange. It might even feel wrong. Just notice your feelings. This is how you feel when you do something differently, the beginning of your change process. Now, clasp your hands back the first way, and the second way, and the first way, and the second way, and the first way, and the second way. Now, how does that feel? feels a little more comfortable, a little more okay. And as you continue to do it, it may even feel normal and natural. It's really just that easy to change a habit, a bit of practice. Let's practice our option of choice. Let's choose to believe that it is easy to change a thought or a pattern. What we choose to believe becomes true for us. If you want to believe that change is hard or difficult, then it will be so for you. But that was the old victim stance, and we're moving away from that belief. As you learn to control your mind, you become powerful. In all of life, the only thing we have control over is our current thought. The past is over and done and cannot be changed, except for the way we choose to look at it. The future is being created right now by the thoughts we are choosing to think. Let's choose thoughts that make our future fun and joyful and loving and prosperous and healthy. If you have a small child that's been used to staying up to midnight and you now decide that 8 o'clock would be a more appropriate bedtime, guess what will happen the first night you put the new time into action? The child will probably kick and scream and carry on. It may even have a tantrum. And if you give in, then the child will find it very difficult to ever accept the new rules. But if you're gentle and firm and insist that this is the new bedtime and allow the child to carry on for a while before it goes to sleep, the next day the resistance will be less. And after a few days of lessening resistance, the child will accept going to bed at the new time. It's the same with our new thoughts and developing new habits. Gentle, firm insistence, consistency in what we choose to think will make the changes quickly and easily. Let's do a physical releasing now. So many times we get so tense and tight and all mixed up about the things we're trying to do and we think we have to work hard for things. That's not really true. We can practice letting go in a relaxed and peaceful way. So close your eyes for a few moments. And I want you to let your whole body relax. Let your scalp relax. Your forehead. All the muscles in back of your eyes. Let your whole face relax. Let your shoulders relax. Have you noticed a difference in your body since we began to relax? If your body has been tense, then it means that your mind has been tense also. Let the rest of your body relax and be very comfortable. Let's affirm together in a peaceful way. I am willing to let go. I release. I relax. I release fear. I release anger. I release guilt. I release sadness. I release limitations. I release my parents' limitations. I am willing to forgive. I am at peace. I am safe. I am me. It is safe to be me. I let go and I am at peace. And then open your eyes. It only takes a moment or two to do this releasing. Do it often 
until relaxing your body and your mind becomes a new habit. Changing doesn't have to be a struggle. We can relax and make it easy. I'm not telling you to hold in your feelings or pretend you're not upset if you are. Sometimes when we get upset, we need to have a physical release. We don't want to swallow our anger down and have it settle in the body so that it becomes pockets of resentment. And there are several methods to release these feelings in positive ways. Now, you could scream in the car with the windows rolled up. You can beat your bed or kick pillows and let yourself make noise and say all the things you want to say. You can scream into a pillow if you're concerned about others hearing you. You can run or play a game like tennis to help release that energy. One day, I noticed I had a pain in my shoulder. And it was there for a couple of days. And I thought, oh dear, what is this? So I sat down and said, all right, Louise, think for a minute. And I said to myself, I have a pain in my shoulder. What does it feel like? It seems to burn, burning, burning. What does that mean? Ah, it must mean anger. And I wondered what I was angry about. And I couldn't think of anything at the moment. So I got out of a couple of pillows and I started to really beat on them with all my might and make angry sounds. And by the time I'd hit the pillows about ten times, I knew exactly what I was angry about. It came right to the surface. So I let it come out and then I released it and let it go. And of course, by the next day, my shoulder was fine. I believe we could all beat the bed or kick pillows at least once a week just to release those physical tensions we all build up in our bodies. If we don't release, then the past holds us back. I do not choose to live in the past, nor be held back by the past any longer. I choose to live in the now and to build a wonderful new future. I've had many people tell me, well, because of such and such, I can no longer enjoy life. I didn't get invited to the prom or the party, so now I'm going to be miserable for the rest of my life. Or I didn't get the part, or I didn't make the sale, so I'm no good. Or because I'm no longer married, I can't enjoy life ever again. What foolish limitations we create for ourselves. Don't let these beliefs from the past hurt you in the now. Release that emotional attachment. If we live fully in this moment, we cannot be hurt by the past, no matter what it was. If I asked you what you wore in the third grade, you may or may not remember. If you remember, you probably wouldn't have much emotional attachment to it. You would just remember and that would be it. And that's how we want to be with all our past experiences. Just recognize them and let them go. Please, Make a list of all the things you are willing to let go of. As you write the list, notice your reactions. And when you finish this list of all the things you're willing to let go of, come back to me. How is your body reacting to the things you said you were willing to release? What will you have to change? What will you have to choose to believe in order to let these old limitations go? Are you willing? How willing? Notice if there is any resistance in your body. Awareness is a key to change. Forgiveness is a major area to work on. Forgiveness opens the doorway to our love and joy. Forgiveness of ourselves and forgiveness of them. The Course in Miracles stresses that forgiveness is the answer to every problem. If we are stuck in any area, we need to forgive. If we have regret or sadness or fear or guilt or blame or anger or resentment or a desire for revenge, all these come from unforgiveness. I repeat again, Love is the answer to every problem, and the doorway to love, the pathway, is through forgiveness. There's a wonderful old Emmett Fox exercise 
for releasing and dissolving resentment that I would like to do with you now. Just close your eyes for a few moments. Allow yourself to visualize or imagine in front of you a small stage. And on that stage, place the person you resent the most. Whoever comes to mind, it could be past or present, living or dead. Allow yourself to see this person clearly. And when you do, see good things happening to this person. Things that would be meaningful to them. And see them smiling and happy. And be aware that you have just dissolved a large chunk of resentment from within yourself. Now, I like to add one step to his exercise. Take that person off the stage and put yourself there. And see good things happening to you. See yourself smiling and happy. And be aware that the abundance of the universe is available to all of us. You could do this exercise daily for a while and then do it at least once a week. It is a lifetime exercise for there is always more clearing and releasing for us to do. Open your eyes. There are many ways to approach forgiveness. In this exercise, I'd like you to use a mirror or work with a partner. And I want you to say, the person I need to forgive is, and I forgive you for. The person I need to forgive is, and I forgive you for. And then work with whoever comes to mind. And as you do this exercise for five or ten minutes, the same person may come up over and over again, or it may be a different person each time. If you can, keep doing the exercise until you've gone through everyone you can think of. If you're working with a partner, have them say to you each time, Thank you, and I set you free. Thank you, and I set you free. Search in your heart for injustices that you still carry and forgive and let them go. When you have forgiven other people, begin to forgive yourself. Say, I forgive myself for. And do this out loud if you can, remembering all the things you want to unburden yourself of. I forgive myself for. Do these forgiveness exercises at least once a week, using a mirror if you don't have a partner. It gets the rubbish out. It's like emptying the trash. You get to feel so much better when it's over. Some people and events will be easy to let go of, and some will be like chipping away at a piece of granite and will take time. It doesn't matter. Do the best you can. In time, even granite will dissolve. The work you are doing on yourself is not a goal. It's a process, a lifetime process. Enjoy the process and notice that as you continue the work, your life gets better. Let's see what we can do to release some of the stuff we all carry about our parents. We're going to play a little music and do a special visualization. Get comfortable. Close your eyes and really relax. Begin to visualize yourself as a little child of five or six and look deeply into this little child's eyes. See the longing that is there and realize that there is only one thing this little child wants from you and that is love. So reach out your arms and embrace this child. Hold it with love and tenderness. Tell it how much you love it, how much you care. Admire everything about this child and say that it's okay to make mistakes while it learns. 
and promise that you will always be there, no matter what. Now let this little child get very small till it's just the size to fit into your heart and put it there. So whenever you look down, you can see this little face looking up at you and you can give it lots of love. Now visualize your mother as a little girl of four or five, frightened and looking for love and not knowing where to find it. Reach out your arms and hold this little girl and tell her how much you love her, how much you care. Let her know she can rely on you to always be there, no matter what. And when she quiets down and begins to feel safe, let her get very small till she's just the size to fit into your heart and put her there with your own little child and let them give each other lots of love. Now imagine your father as a little boy of three or four, frightened, crying, and looking for love. See the tears rolling down his little face as he doesn't know where to turn. You have become good at comforting frightened little children, so reach out your arms and hold his trembling little body. Comfort him, croon to him. Let him feel how much you love him. Let him feel that you will always be there for him. And when his tears are dry, and you feel the love and the peace in his little body, let him get very small, just the size to fit into your heart, and put him there, so those three little children can give each other lots of love, and you can love them all. There is so much love in your heart that you could heal the entire planet. Just for now, let's use this love to heal you. Feel a warmth beginning to glow in your heart center, a softness, a gentleness, and let this feeling begin to change the way you think and feel about yourself. You are love. You are worth loving. Know that. And when it feels comfortable, come back to the room. Now is the time to build new thought patterns to replace the old thinking. Old thinking goes something like this. I don't want to be old, I don't want to be fat, I don't want this job, I don't want this lover, I don't want this house. We have been taught to fight the negative, thinking that by fighting the negative, the positive will automatically come. It doesn't work that way. How often have you lamented something? Did it get you what you really wanted? The more we dwell on what we don't want, the more we will get it. Things that you disliked about yourself in the past are probably still with you. What you put your attention on grows, so let's put our attention on what we really want. Concentrate on what you do want to have or be. Turn all your thoughts into positive affirmations. Learn to think this way. Take I don't want and turn it into I am or I have. I hate my job gets you nowhere except stuck in that job. I now accept a wonderful new job will begin to open channels in your consciousness and in the universe to bring a new and better position your way. Bless what you have with love and release it. Then affirm what you want in positive ways. Don't put your affirmation in the future. Work in present tense. Instead of saying, I'm going to have or I want to have, 
say I have or I am. Always be in the now. I am eternally young. I have a slender body. I now accept a new job. I have a wonderful relationship. I see myself moving into a beautiful new home. These affirmations give your subconscious mind something to work on in the now. Love yourself in the now. Forgive yourself in the past. Love yourself in the now. You will find if you practice this, it will be like having a magic wand to work with. Your whole life will transform. And when you love yourself, you get to feel good too. You can't really love yourself without self-approval and self-acceptance. This means no criticism of yourself whatsoever. I can hear the objections immediately. That's just the old mind doing its chatter. Go beyond it. Say to your mind, thank you for sharing. Now, pick up the mirror again, and looking into your eyes, say to yourself, I love and approve of myself exactly as I am. I love and approve of myself exactly as I am. Is it a little easier to say it now that we've done the other exercises, or is it still difficult? This is the main issue to concentrate on. If it's easier to say now, keep going. It'll become a real pleasure, and your life will improve all the time. If it's still difficult to admit love for yourself, then practice. Remember the thumbs. Looking into the mirror three or four times a day and just saying, I love you, I really, really love you, will work miracles in your life. I remember when my own denial of my good was so strong that I used to loathe looking at myself. Sometimes I used to be so angry I would even slap my own face. And now I look back at those times and see how foolish that was. And I forgive myself. But in those days, my belief in my own lack and limitations was stronger than anything anyone could say to the contrary. My early childhood gave me many opportunities to create self-loathing. When I was 18 months, my parents divorced and I was put into a series of foster homes. And when I was five, I was raped by a neighbor. And then my mother remarried and my stepfather both battered and abused me. And these were also the depression days and there was no money. And by the time I left home at 15, I had a really poor self-image of myself and many heavy negative beliefs to overcome. And it all took time to change. If someone would say to me, I love you, my first reaction would be, why? What could you possibly see in me? Or my other thought would be, if they only knew they wouldn't love me. And it took quite some time and much work for me to develop a peaceful, loving relationship with myself. And I'm still improving it. This is a lifetime process. We begin by getting the boulders out of the way, and then we progress to the smaller issues. Begin to look for small things you can approve of in yourself. That's what I did. In the beginning, when I found it difficult to see anything good about myself, that I could approve of. I started with my fingernails and my ears, and then I went to some of my internal organs. It's pretty hard to be angry at your liver. Begin to find things that you can approve of. Begin to love yourself or like yourself, even for just a few seconds. The smallest beginning will help. One second of self-approval will make a shift in consciousness that you can build on. We don't have to do it all at once. If every day you could love yourself for one minute more, it wouldn't take too long to make an enormous change in your life. This work accelerates and it goes faster and gets easier all the time. Good health, love, prosperity, creative self-expression all begin with loving the self. As we learn to love and approve of ourselves continuously, our changes get easier and we really make progress. Instead of, I'm a bad person and so I have to change, let's say I love myself and these are the things I want to change. 
We are always changing, and we're either changing negatively or positively. If our thoughts are negative and demeaning, then our changes are negative. If our thoughts are positive and loving, then our changes are positive too. I cannot tell you exactly what your future will be like, but I know that if you choose to be negative and resentful and fearful and guilty, you are going to have an uncomfortable life before you, and perhaps illness too. If you are loving and approving and joyous and accepting of others and trusting in the process of life, then you are going to have a wonderful life. It will be joyful and pleasant for you. You have a choice of which way to go. Here's an exercise I've given to many people, and it works wonders, almost like a miracle. If you will do this exercise consistently, it will also work miracles in your life. For at least a month, I want you to say to yourself, silently or aloud, I approve of myself. I approve of myself. I approve of myself. Do it at least 500 times a day. You may say, oh, but that's so much. And yet I know when you are worrying, you can repeat a worry thought more than 500 times a day. Keep saying it over and over and over again. I approve of myself. If negative thoughts come up, just say, thank you for sharing, I let you go. And repeat, I approve of myself. Let any resistance pass through. Remember, resistance has no power over you if you don't give it power. Keep repeating, I approve of myself, no matter what is happening. And if you can keep repeating it, even if something unpleasant is happening, then you have really grown. Your love for yourself is the most important thing in your life. The more you love yourself, the more you will be creating wonderful experiences for yourself. Now, as we draw to a close on this tape, I would like you to remember what you give out, you get back. What you believe about yourself and about life becomes true for you. We create our experiences by our thoughts and beliefs. Love is the great healer. The doorway to love is through forgiveness. And you can leave the past behind and become free. Allow yourself to claim the new. That which you desire, visualize it. Imagine having or doing or being it. Fill in the details. Feel it. Taste it. Touch it. Hear it. See it. See other people reacting to you. And make it okay, whatever their reactions are. Read everything you can find. Explore many teachers. Investigate all that you can. You know this tape is only one step on your pathway. Use it often, and you will get new ideas every time you do. Practice, and you will demonstrate ever-increasing good. Remember, a little child who gave up at the first fall would never learn to walk. Try it all, and then use what works for you. Trust life to be on your side and to provide everything you need. Life can be fun, even the learning process. Make it so. Let the old things dissolve. Notice the little miracles in your life. Love who and what you are and where you are. It's only a transition point. Laugh at yourself and at life, and nothing can touch you. I thank you for sharing time with me, and join me in knowing. In the infinity of life where we all are, all is perfect, whole, and complete. Each one of us, myself included, experiences the richness and fullness of life in ways that are meaningful to us. I now look at the past with love and choose to learn from my old experiences. There is no right or wrong, nor good or bad. The past is over and done. There is only the experience of the moment. 
I love myself for bringing myself through this past into this present moment. I share what and who I am, for I know that we are one in spirit. Everything I need to know is revealed to me. Everything I need comes to me. All is well in my world. And so it is. Thank you.